So today, our topic, our topic for today is organizational restructuring, a fireside chat. And we want to ask the audience a question, is it the need of the hour? So for today we have on our, we have on our panel, Marcus, who is the CEO for Carrera and Ariana and Camelon. He has years and years of experience behind him. We call him our Swiss guru, our Swiss digital guru. He is going to be our first speaker. He's going to, he's going to talk about uh, the organization, the, our topic today. He's going to be the first speaker and we are waiting to hear from him. We have Kevin, who is a chief research officer. Chief research officer. Kevin's going to tell us why that is. We have not many of us have heard that designation. So we'd love to know more about it from Kevin, if he has. We have Dr. Sandeep, who is a psycho psychiatrist, psychotherapist. He will be, he's gonna talk about mental health, productivity, changing times of today. So, so let's talk about why. So today's content is, why did it take COVID for this? AI, that's me talking. Then there's AI and ML, Marcus. Hierarchies, again, Marcus. Work timings and workspaces. Work from home perspectives. That would be Kevin talking. Training, realigned. Mental health, a much needed perspective by Dr. Sandeep. And then we're gonna wrap up and we're gonna have an open forum Q&A. So ladies and gentlemen, let's sit back, relax and hear the session. Why did we choose this topic? One of the reasons was this famous saying by Herculetus who said, the only thing that is constant is change. And this quote by Herculetus, an ancient Greek philosopher encapsulates the essence of organizational restructuring. It emphasizes that change in an inherent and inevitable part of life, including within organizations. To stay relevant and competitive, organizations must be willing to adapt and restructure their operations, strategies, and structures when necessary. This quote serves as a reminder that resisting change or clinging to the status quo can hinder progress and growth while embracing change and restructuring can lead to innovation, improvement, and success. Moving on, let's talk about why we chose this topic. Now, this is what Herculetus talked about was, what Herculetus said was, uh, he talked about, was, was one of the reasons we decided that we want to talk about this topic. Change is, or is, not, is the only constant in life, but it may not be the only comfort. It may not be comfortable to take that change. So why is organizational research or organizational restructuring important to talk about? Why do we need to talk about it? And why did it take a COVID to realize this? So we heard about what Herculetus has to say. Now, post COVID, we saw that a lot of adjustments and changes organizations had to make in response to the pandemic's impact on the general, on the organizations that had to face this pandemic where it was life and death at stake. This restructuring aims to address the challenges posed by the pandemic and the positions that organizations for future success is needed. Okay, so some of the slides, some of the things that we came across was these other slides that we shall sh show as we move on. So that's a couple of slides that we came across. So these are all, these are all inevitable changes that had to happen post COVID. And if these changes did not happen, we would have repercussions in terms of other situational changes happening. So coming back to, so we have, we had to have an agile system. We had to have remote work arrangements that Kevin's gonna talk further about. We had to have cost cutting measurements, agility and resilience, realigning priorities and strategies. So all digital transformation, absolutely, which Marcus is gonna talk about. So it had to be happened at a scale that was unforeseen so far. Talent management and reskilling. 
all these factors which we would probably touch upon and talk in depth. Okay, so now I shall hand over the, the forum to Marcus. Marcus is going to speak on uh, hierarchies, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. So here, you, here we go, Marcus. It's all yours. Okay, good. So I would share the screen from my side, then like, oh, you have to make me to a presenter, I think. I thought you were co-host, okay. Not yet. Yeah, Bessie, you're gonna have to make both Marcus and me co-hosts. Yes. In the meantime, I would just encourage those who are um, listening in, you know, very interested to know what is it about org restructuring that they're most interested in? And so please feel free to use the chat if you've got questions or comments or anything that you'd like Marcus and me and Bissy to address. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so I will talk about technology li like often. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's my, in the end, my, my passion, it's my hobby, it's the thing I do um, all the time in life. And how does technology affect organizations? And um, if you think of today, in which time we live, I, I always tell people, we live in the most exciting time we could live. It's a time where everything changes. It's a time where we are at a, at a start of some, something new. And um, I believe there is a lot out there to be explored and a lot to be worked on. And, and um, I think that's why it's very, very exciting to live in these times. Um, let me tell you a small story about um, technology and about um, yeah, what I experienced some years ago. It, it was, um, about three, four years ago, more four years ago. And um, it was a time where we already developed artificial intelligence systems. So quite an early stage, but we were already on the road. And um, at that time, we developed a system for planning, so corporate planning. And perhaps you know what's behind corporate planning. It's um, a lot of Excel work. So what you do is you predict the future as a salesperson and you plan, okay, how many turnover do I make with this customer in this country and in this industry? And that means you create a lot of Excel files. These Excel files will be consolidated by a corporate department again, and that creates a lot of work and, and it's quite, quite hard. And what we thought at that point of time was, we build an AI system. We train that with information, for example, growth um, of countries, growth of regions, or things like also seasons, because some seasons change the demand in different products. So we built a system which could be trained on different variables and could plan in the end, do the sales plan. And the system worked quite well. And, and we, we um, trained that on historic data, it was quite exciting. And what happened at that point of time was um, the people didn't use it. So the salespeople were in the beginning very happy that they didn't need to do this Excel exercise again. But when they saw that this is somehow a black box, they didn't use it. And I think, that was the time of the beginning of AI. Then a lot happened and, and busy told already about COVID. So a lot changed in this time. And now we are again changing with the, the, this AI drive, which comes especially from ChatGPT and OpenAI. So I believe today this would work. The mindset is different. The people have changed their mindset. And I believe today it would be much easier to bring such systems into into corporates into the world and that's that's a small story and that's what i like to talk about 
So what is important for companies, it's change. And um, this is a famous quote by Albert Einstein. And he said, the measure of intelligence is the ability to change. And if you look at successful companies, really successful companies, um, then they are able to change. And if you break it down into profits, then 20% of the companies make 95% of the profits. So again, 20% make 95% of the profits. So this, these are the successful ones and they are able to change and they drive. And that's the things what we want to talk about with you today and um, go deeper into it. So changing organizations, how do AI and technology, how does that change organizations? And I have here a small list with, um, yeah, with, with um, areas where there are effects. So on the one hand side, automation and efficiency, on the other hand side, decision-making, customer experience, new business models and operational optimizations of what happens in the production. And um, busy, I would ask you, can you start a poll? And then I would say, let's have a vote on that one. So which is the one which is the, creates the biggest effects? Yes. So here is the vote. So I hope we are some people to vote. And those who are. So let's see, just vote. And then we can see how it's going. So here are the first votes. Ah, okay, interesting. Automation is in front. Yeah, and, 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 pardon? That's 100% automation efficiency. Yeah. Yeah, so we see it's yeah, it's it's goes in automation direction. Should I end the poll, Marcus? Yeah, we can end it. Okay, we have a, a winner. I think it's automation and efficiency. And um, I I was nearly expecting that because that's all everywhere in the media also. So from that side. Um, so there's a tie between customer experience and new business models. Yeah, and a little bit the, the operational Optimism side. Optimization, yes. So let's go a little bit deeper into it. So automation and efficiency, what's behind that? And I have here a, a quite new um, analysis from Goldman Sachs. And they have analyzed regarding exactly this point, automation and efficiency. Um, what happens in the industry. And they analyzed that one fourth of current work tasks across industries could be automated by AI. And what we have seen in the past in the production in the 50, 40, 30 years ago, we have seen that production was more and more automated, still is today, now digitalized, but we see now the same process happening in the offices. And if we see at this list is very interesting to see. Um, these are often high quality jobs like legal, like architecture, like um, yeah, business, financial operations, even management if affected by AI. So that's a new trend what we see. And, and that's a very new direction which we haven't seen yeah, some years ago, let's say five or 10 years ago. Um, enhanced decision-making is something which is also evolving at the moment and, and growing. And um, I have here only some examples. And, and one example is about medical diagnosis. So systems are often better if there is a mass of data involved and a mass of historical data. So what if systems can learn from historical data, for example, medical treatments, and um, can analyze that and help doctors to, to, to make better decisions. 
So that's a direction we see at the moment. Another one is um, financial investments. There are many financial robots in the meantime out there. So robots who decide about investments and there is only from legal side, at least I know it in Europe, it's, it's needed that the human still execute the transaction, but in the end, the robot analyzes already everything. And another example we, we see daily already about decision-making is if you buy something. So the shops, and if you look at Amazon or other shops, they are already, it's, it's possible that they suggest you very directly what you really want, what is really interesting for you. So decision-making processes are starting to grow from the AI side, and we will see a lot also going into the management. And I'm sure there will be management decision systems that will help us to make better decisions for companies in the future. Yeah, that's, I think, the very famous one. Everybody knows it at the moment. Everybody uses it. Um, it was not there just, just some months ago, and it changes everything. And think of customer experience. So how difficult was it only some time ago when you had these chat bots um, and, and you chatted with your telecom company, for example. It was sometimes really hard and a pain. And after two questions, they connected you to a service person and the service person was not available. So you were again waiting on the call and that will change. This, this whole customer experience, I'm sure with what evolved with ChatGPT, that will have impacts and that will change a lot and help us a lot to, um, yeah, to, to handle such requests easier, faster, and with massive higher quality. Business models, a, a very big one. And, and from my side also, one of the exciting ones. So business models have always changed and, and that's a an example chain of business models. There are several models available like this. And yeah, we come from mass production. We went into distribution and marketing models. Then there was this e-commerce and internet boom with the, with the starting of the internet. Then we have um, this customer-centric models and we go massively at the moment into data-driven and of course, um, connected with artificial intelligence models. And um, I, I can tell you an, an, an example. I have, um, I work often also in the machine industry. And um, if you look at the machine industry, there are two approaches today. So the one, the classical one is the engineering side. You look at a machine from the engineering side. And the other one is you look from the data side. And, and the question and, and the exciting point for me is at the moment, which companies will in the future be the more profitable ones? Are the ones who produce the machines or are the ones who are in, in able to analyze the data? So that will change a lot also from business model side. And there we will see a lot of new, new ideas coming into the markets. Then, um, yeah changing organizations from the operational side. And, and here I have the topic with smart production. Perhaps you heard of dark factories. Dark factories are factories where no people are inside. There are some people in a control room, but the rest is completely done by machines. And that's not future, that's already reality. There are such factories already um, working. And Machines are connecting, machines can talk with each other, machines can um, analyze and predict when they have problems, they analyze the energy consumption, raw material consumption. Um, yeah, everything is tracked in real time and you get the information as a responsible person for this, um, this, this plant when something is happening. So that's... That's on the way. And, and of course, we have still a lot of classical productions, but there is a big, big um, movement into the direction to optimization and higher productivity. And I've seen plants which had, after changes of, of connectivity, uh, productivity increased by 30%. So that's the side from the yeah, from the technology. And I want to jump now into the other topic, 
into the hierarchies, into yeah, how do we work together? And, and how do we work together when we think of what is changing and what is coming on the way from technology side? And I have here a study from um, McKinsey and they say, um, yeah, there are four pillars in the end, which we should look at, which are very important. And the first one is more connectivity. What that means is, yes, technology, but on the other side, also people. So in the, in the classical world, we come from the hierarchical structure. So that was one direction, top down. But today we have a lot of, of very well-educated experts in the company. So they are not going top down and, and bottom up. They also go side on the side. So you have a lot of connectivity and interactions and that affects our working, how we work. Another point are lower transaction costs. And, and I think if you look at scalability today, at scalability of of business models or scalability of what you do, it's more scalable than ever it was in the past. If you think of what the cloud um, achievement made us possible, it's, it's unbelievable. It's models which were in the past not possible. So that's a big transformation. Automation, we have talked about already um, this point. And, and I think, um, yeah, that's, that's also a, a big one which will change the management structure. And another one is society shifts. Think about the next generation which comes to our factories, to our offices, to the shop floors, everywhere. And they have another mindset. And I work a lot with young people, very young people, students, and um, they, they think different. They have other ideas. And that's very important to, to take care of so, so that we know um, how to make them successful in the future. If, if we break that down now, so what should we do? And, and that's the big question. So, so what can be done? And I, I like this model very much. That's also from the Happy study. Should I release the poll? Should I release yeah, the we, poll? Can, we can release it already. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the poll is about um, hierarchical structures. So how is your company organized? We are not that many people. So let's see. And um, do you work in a, in a hierarchical structure or in a non-hierarchical structure, in a more agile structure? So let's see if someone is... Oh, we are hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, it's it's not often that companies are really different organized or very flat organized. Okay, I think that's yeah, that's hundred percent, and I think that's the direction yeah, yeah. we already thought of. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so what does it mean? Um, what, what do we have to do um, as a company to be successful and to, and to organize in the way that it really runs for us, that it's the future and that we go forward? And in this study, there are three areas which are very exciting in my opinion. So the one area is who we are. And that was often forgotten in the past by companies. The second area is how we operate. And the third area is how we grow. So let's start who we are. And a main, main point is propose. And propose um, has, in my opinion, increased, um, that the importance of in, uh, propose has increased a lot in the last years. And um, I think we want to be part of something bigger. We as humans, it's not enough to just have a job or to do something to earn money, we want to be part of something bigger and we want to be create something. We want to create big things. Um, we need, companies need also value again in agenda. So that means values which fit to us also as a person. And if that fits, that can be successful. Um, and, and of course, culture as the secret source. And 
I tell always to people, culture is um, the key competitive advantage of companies. Because with culture, we differentiate us. We are different in the culture and we react different. We, we work different. And that's the really the power we have as companies. I will tell you a small example um, from one of, of um, the startups where I work in. And um, we have just um, had just an open position in just recently in sales for um, Quarero. That's a student platform we run. And um, we give people the opportunity, so students, the opportunity to work with companies and all across the world. And that means a lot of people or students which are living in poor countries have the opportunity to work with companies from Europe, from US, from, yeah, with, with also big companies. And we, we posted this job offer and we got 40, 50 applications per day. And we had to stop after three days because it was overloading us with applications. And I never saw that before because normally when we, we post jobs, um, then it's, it's quite yeah, low. It's, it's quite, you get two or three per day maximum applications. And I asked the people, why are you all applying for this job? And they said, you know, you have, um, you have a great vision. You have a great purpose. You have something bigger, and I like to be part of that. And that was very exciting for me to see that um, people look a lot on the vision, on the idea behind the company, and not only on on the classical things, on the money, on the working conditions, all these kind of things. And that was super exciting for me to see. And there were a lot of young people who applied for these jobs, and um, we were really overloaded with applications. So, so the second part, how we operate, and, and that's very important in terms of the structure on the one hand side, and here it's written radically flattened structure. So structures which are agile, um, I run a lot of projects completely in an agile way. That means there is more power in the team. The team decides, not, not an, an, an top manager decides, and, and the team takes care and prioritizes also the work. Then um, turbocharged decision-making. A, a big point is here, um, there are studies about that, that companies who decide fast are more successful. So how can you be faster in making decisions, making better decisions? And of course, we, we talked already about that, talent. And, and talent is the main point um, today because that's a, a big differentiator. Then um, the last point is how we grow. So first of all, you need an ecosystem. And I think that's also very important to, to remember. Um, it's not only that we are alone, we need partners. We need um, people who help us. And that can be um, suppliers, that can be other companies, that can be corporations. And I think there is a lot of potential still for companies which is not yet used. Then we have learning and, and here, of course, it's the growth mindset. It's the idea to grow and learn together and, and an organization has to be more, yeah, more in the way of continuous learning. And um, the last point, and, and that's, Coming back again where we started, that's the topic of data platforms, of technology, and, and build on your data. So, yeah, my, my last slide is now, how, how can you achieve that? And um, it's, it's a big thing. It's not just something you do in, in some months or a, a little program that takes years. Change, propose, work on culture, build structures, um, build an ecosystem. That's a big thing. And I, I'm part in just, um, yeah, not that long, two months in, an, in another startup. And I thought that fits exactly in that direction. What we do there is, and um, I want to show you that. Uh, we jump over that. So what we do here is, um, we, 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 we have on the one hand side, we can go to classical approach. That means you go to a consultant, you work with a consulting company and you get ideas. 
And what we started here with this, um, yeah, with this, this company, it's called Be Up. We have a crowd of innovators. That means at the moment, 7,000 people. And we create case studies and drop these case studies into this crowd of innovators. And they work on these problems. And out of these problems, they create ideas, a lot of ideas. We, we can collect all these ideas. And in the end, you get only the relevant best ideas for your problems and for your strategy, for your growth ideas, for your whatever you want to do with your company, for your cultural transformation. And I think that's just as a, as a new approach, a new idea for you to think about um, it, it must not be always the classical way. It can be also something new. It can be also the leverage of using a lot of people instead of only some people to, to have better decisions. So that's part from my side. And yeah, I want to give now the word to Kevin and, and thanks a lot for listening. And I'm still here for questions um, if you have questions later. Awesome, Marcus, I'm gonna go ahead and show my screen. Can, um, so hopefully, oh, hold on here. Let me stop share and I'm gonna reshare because I gotta make sure I've got an audio clip and I want people to be able to hear something. And so here we go. Awesome. Hey, Marcus, I had a question for you, um, just myself. Great. And I put it in, um, I put it in the chat. Are, are you familiar with a company um, it's a Dutch company called Bertzorg. No, I don't know them. No. Okay. I, I, it was just really interesting. I was loving, you know, what you were talking about, but the flat organizations. And we had uh, Gary Hamill from the London Business School speak at a, a major event for my company recently. And, um, and Gary just wrote a book called Humanocracy, but he was talking about a company called Bertzorg, which... I literally, if I if I can remember correctly, I think they've got maybe twelve uh, like senior leaders in their company. But then they have it's so flat. Underneath that, there's four thousand individual work wow. teams wow. that are completely entirely managed by themselves, and it's just it's just seems amazing. Um, and right along the lines of what you were talking about. Amazing. Sounds sounds really interesting. That's that's quite huge with um, so many people. That's quite yeah. huge. I, yeah. I know some companies with several hundred people who, who are totally flat and only working in small groups together. But um, 4,000 is quite huge. <laughs> right on. Well, all right. Well, I, I I found your, your information really fascinating. One of the things I loved what you shared with at the end was uh, Marcus was from McKinsey where they were really pointing back to purpose and culture. And I think those are really very easily but critically important things, but they're easily overlooked when it comes to organizational change. And uh, I don't know if this is where you were going with one of your slides where you were saying, hey, you know what, let's crowdsource this, or maybe we just go to an outsourced consultant. But um, uh, what I've heard time and time again is organizations, when they outsource, this is not a slam against consultancies at all. But, you know, if you're outsourcing a significant org change to a consultant, they don't understand necessarily the cultural implications or the culture and how things get done within the organization. And you were talking about the criticality of, you know, change. And, you know, we've been writing about this for years now of how um, we're in a, an era of continuous disruption where the goal is not to manage change, it's to manage a mid change. And it's the mindset piece that holds so many people back from the ability to change. And so I want to build on that a bit. And so, you know, Bissy asked me, she said, oh, chief research officer, what in the world is that? Well, let me, I'll just <laughs> sum it up real quickly. I work for a firm, if you're not familiar with I4CP, it's, it's an acronym for the Institute for Corporate Productivity. 
Um, we believe globally we produce more research in the area of human capital than any firm that we know of. And we've been doing it for decades. And, um, but one thing that makes our research unique is that we're constantly looking through the lens of human capital um, at business outcomes. So what my team constantly is doing is correlating the practices that we study related to people and human capital back to five-year business outcomes in revenue, profitability, customer satisfaction, and market share. And we define the in our studies the group of organizations that take part in our studies that are in the upper quartile of those five-year growth trends. They're high-performance organizations. The group of organizations that are in the lower end of the quartile in those five-year uh, growth trends, we call them lower performance organizations. And so what our focus is, is what do the high performance organizations do differently with regard to their people, their culture, et cetera, than low performance organizations? And then further, do they have any type of statistical relationship to the business outcomes? And so what my team will do is we'll do all kinds of uh, regression analysis on it and see if there's a positive or a negative significant correlation. It's not causal, it just means that there is a, a degree of influence on these. And then that also allows us to find not just best practices, uh, what distinguishes high performance organizations, but really what the next practices are. And you know, one of the next practices, and I'll, I'll reference this, it took a pandemic to usher in flexible and hybrid work on a massive wide scale. Um, 10 years ago in a research report we called Beyond Uber, the new era of work, we were highlighting in that research report how a mega trend that was going to hit companies square in the, in the forehead was worker demand across all generations for control and flexibility in what they work on, where they work, when they work, um, and even who they work for. And so what we're able to do as a firm is uh, we're not in the business of predicting things, but our next practices really give our member organizations insight into what they need to be preparing for next. And what I wanted to share with everyone here is we're a research firm that does not do vendor sponsored research. Um, the only research that we do is for our member organizations. This is a smattering of the hundreds around the world, the governments and the corporations that are in our member network, and they have exclusive access to our research and to each other. Um, and you know, we're happy to share it externally on occasion through webinars like this. Kevin, uh, could you put it on the slideshow? Uh, I thought here. Let me, full screen. Try full yeah, screen. Uh, let me kind of go back here. I thought I was in slideshow mode. So, so I yeah. wanted to interrupt you, but I didn't want to block your, you know, your process of talking. Absolutely. So, so you tell me, is this in slideshow mode yeah, right it's, now? It's, um, it's, uh, yeah, this seems okay, but I think it's a little small, the size. Oh, okay. Yeah. Something. Um, the slideshow, slide, full, uh, full screen. Yeah, it's yeah, getting. I, well, here's the crazy thing is I am in full screen on my side and um, but somehow it's not letting me show it in full screen to you. So let me try okay, right one more time. We, we can't see it. Yeah, okay. I think it's coming on. Hang on. Well. Yeah, um, just press slide show. You see the button there? Or, yeah, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, the PowerPoint slide show. It should I work. Just, I just did. And it's still not doing that, huh? That's fine. Oh, yeah, it's much better now. Fine. Oh, fantastic. Great. Okay. Glad it finally uh, worked. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's go back to the structure piece here. Um, you know, what, to me, I think one of the things that's really interesting right now is there's not a corporate boardroom right now or leadership um, discussion that doesn't involve productivity. And one of the studies we just conducted, we just conducted a, a very significant global study on productivity. We're going to start publishing the results to our members um, at the uh, middle of next month. But what I wanted to share with you is when we look at the data and we were looking, we were asking people, what is your current work model? So they could pick, it is 
on site. We have mandated everyone and every role is back on site or it's hybrid. You know, uh, we've mandated a few days a week or a few days a month where they need to be back on site, but the other days they can work from other locations or flexible. Flexible meaning that it was entirely up to the decision of the employee with their manager, that they that the employee had a great deal of say in that, or fully remote. So a, a company that has completely gone fully remote. So they had those four answer selections. Then what we asked them is, is when did you implement your current work model? And so we knew when they implemented those. And then the next question was, once you implemented those work models, um, has there been an impact on productivity at your firm? And they could choose increased, decreased, remain the same, or don't know. And it was astonishing the number of people that said don't know, which, uh, which belies something which I'll share with you in just a moment. But what was also really interesting is the data uniformly showed, and these are all global HR leaders, nearly a thousand that took part in this study from 54 countries, nearly all of them, no matter what their work model, said that since they implemented their work model, their productivity has gone up. So it, it either had gone up or it had remained the same. Hardly any indicated that it had decreased. And what's interesting is when you compare that, and I'm sharing you a data point from the conference board that they published just the other day, they said that labor productivity growth among mature economies has been weak, especially in the US and France. And so there is a big misunderstanding within corporations. My personal hypothesis is that most CEOs do not know how their org don't know how their organization measures productivity. And so this conundrum here around productivity is something that really affects the structure conversation. So let me let me get into this in just a moment. What we know from another survey that we conducted is at 75%, and this is according to human resources leaders around the world, 75% of large companies, these are companies with at least 1,000 employees, were restructuring their HR functions as a direct result of the pandemic. Now, because of that, we created a, a a renovating HR structures and systems guidebook that our members can use. But what I want to share with all of you is we've done two very significant global studies in the last five years on HR restructuring. And what the data from both of the studies has come back made unequivocally clear is that there is no HR structure that is best. Now, I hate, in fact, I mean, the only HR structure that is, is best is the one that allows you to best execute your strategy. Now, that may seem really simple, and I, and I hate saying that for people who are listening here and saying, well, what HR structure should we go with? I'm going to give you some questions to think through that we believe will help you immensely in figuring out what that structure is. Now, I also wanted to share this. This is one of my favorite quotes. Now this comes from the former CEO of American Airlines. He also was the former vice chair at Dell. He's been a former board of director at Barrick Gold and at companies around the world. This gentleman's name is Don Carty. And I think Don put it up, put this together so well, which is he thinks that leaders too often look to structural org change as the solution to a problem, like what are we gonna do around productivity? And he's saying, he thinks that this is really ignorant or naive in his words. He's saying, you gotta look at your people. The people are the solution, not the structure. 
And I've had similar quotes from many executives over the years that back this up. So what I wanted to do is I wanted just to, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on a model that we know um, can really help any business executive, whether they're in HR, finance, the CEO, anyone, when they're thinking about either a functional reorg or a business structure reorg, what they should be thinking through that allows them to understand if there is a structural change that needs to take place, what does that best need to look like? And, and you'll see how this ties back to something Marcus shared earlier, where I, I want to go back to that McKinsey model, where you could see in the core of that were things like culture, which are critical not to be overlooking. So, you know, with that, I'm going to share with you a, a video in just a mi minute here, but um, you know, I, I, just, I just wanted to pause for a second because, you know, Marcus, if you're still on or busy or if there's anyone who's who's put any comments in chat, I'd like to get any reaction so far to anything I shared. Yes, I'm going to take a look. Um, so there was somebody who mentioned about restructuring of data, but that was, I think, when Marcus was talking. Yeah. <clears throat> And there was somebody else who, Janice, who mentioned chat GPT use cases. Uh, but I think, um, Kevin, you talked about a lot of people not using it, right? I think you mentioned uh, well, it. Well, yeah, I, I, I can share this with you. Yeah, I, I shared the data earlier. What we know, well, it, it's interesting. I think it depends on who you talk to. So if you're talking to HR executives, which my company does every day more than anyone, yeah you'll find hand over fist that HR is not using generative AI right now. They're a third are experimenting with it roughly, um, but it's, you know, they're moving fast. Two months ago when we polled about 400 at our conference in, in Arizona, 75% basically said, this is two and a half months ago, um, we're just hearing about it right now. Now, two months later, 75% are saying we're having big discussions on this, right? Or this latest poll we just did of 62 HR leaders, 61% say we're discussing it. So things are rapidly evolving. But I'll also share this. I had a conversation last week with two engineering executives from two different high-tech uh, firms. This is the same conversation. And both of them were saying that generative AI was being uh, encouraged within their organizations heavily. And in their engineering departments, they were experimenting it, if not using them already very heavily. So I really believe it comes down to the function within the organization. And, um, and this is a, we're actually conducting, we're going to kick off a large global study busy in the middle of June on AI in HR. And so for anyone in the audience here who's really interested in the HR function and where AI is being applied, um, you know, I would invite them to take part in that survey because they'll get the, the data that we get back uh, for free as a, as a thank you. Um, wow, amazing. Yeah. A anyone else? A any other questions or comments? Yes, uh, I don't see. Oh, yeah. Apple actually just recently banned chat GPT. That's Tina. Recently yeah. for internal use. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing that too. We're seeing several firms um, that have gone ahead and banned that. We actually just put that out as a, uh, uh, in, a in a survey to our member organizations, and many of them are banning it um, right now internally. I, I would say this. There is a very large global organization that um, it's an NGO, and I'm not going to name them. Um, everyone would know them, but I was talking to one of their HR leaders uh, two weeks ago, and she said that they had banned it, generative AI, but then they did an informal analysis. They looked at the system data that they were capturing from their workers, and they found that over 4,000 employees were actually using it through their work computers. And so, you know, um, there's got to be, uh, there's a big push right now on guardrails. And 
what I would suggest if you're working in HR is you've got to be partnering with your legal and your IT. There is just not enough partnership. There's a lot between HR and legal. There's not enough between HR and IT. And this is one area where they've got to be uh, working hand in glove. Right. And for the, the, uh, for the audience, uh, I think Kevin's mentioned something about a book called Humanocracy. Humanocracy. Okay, let's say democracy. So you guys can read the chat. Uh, Kevin, do you want to read it out or we just leave it at that? Oh yeah, we'll just leave it at that. And 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 I appreciate Tina participating in chat here. Yeah, due to data data yes. leakage, without a doubt. You know, I think what's really interesting, you could see in just the last month, you've got companies like IBM that have announced uh, Watson X, which is basically privatization of Chat GPT for a company, right? Where they can have their own version of this. A lot of startup firms, I'm sure Marcus is all on top of this. Um, and Marcus, I would invite you to comment on this, but so many young, uh, smaller firms popping up where they're saying, hey, you know, we know that you're afraid of data leakage, getting out there your own data in chat GPT, which now becomes part of, um, you know, anyone else's access to data. Um, now we're going to create for your own private environment, your own chat GPT or generative AI use internally. And that's how fast things are evolving. And that's that's going to be game changing for so many companies that aren't. And so I don't know, Marcus, if you had a comment on that before I continue on or not. Yeah, I see it the same way. And I see it also popping up a lot of startups in that area. And and many small companies come with solutions and ideas there. And we will see what's happening. But I see that also massively influencing how companies work in the future. If you have a a corporate know-how center, whatever, how you call it, you just chat or talk with that and get all information about, yeah, your processes, your company, everything you need. Absolutely. And, and, and the, big, the big thing there is, and what my company is working on right now is a bias audit checklist for generative AI. Because what happens is, is, Companies, you know, there's bias built into just into lots of data. And that's either through processes that were biased in the first place or, you know, ranking systems that were both subjective and objective. And there's bias that creeps into so many areas. And if you've got bias within your data, which most companies do, then that bias is going to be reflected in what generative AI then pulls back and suggest back to you. And so one of the things we're working on is a, is a bias audit checklist for generative AI. And Marcus, I mean, I, I was just wondering if, if you're familiar with how, or any companies that um, are addressing that issue right now with their own data and when it comes to generative AI and bias. I, I have not, to say, I have not seen a company who addresses it at the moment. Okay. I've not okay. seen it until now. Thanks. Well, I, I just, you know, I think this is a really interesting conversation. Certainly it's, we're just at the precipice of it and, we're, and it's going to continue and continue to be more rich. That's for sure. Um, and Marcus, I'll connect with you on the, uh, uh, on the back end because I think it'd be really cool to um, make you aware of the study we've got going next month. Um, what I want to do here is this. I want to kind of pull this back to the structure piece. I want to pull it back to the culture piece because I can't overemphasize the importance of culture. You're looking at two very famous business executives. On the left is a gentleman named Ajay Banga. Now, Ajay um, is now retired, but he was the longstanding CEO at MasterCard and chairman at MasterCard global payments firm. On the right is the current CEO of Microsoft, and he's been the CEO for about nine years, Satya Nadella. These two are having a discussion at the FinTech Ideas Festival a few years ago. And they were talking about the importance of continuous change. And what I wanna do is I want you to hear this exchange. And specifically what Satya is talking about, because it really, I've been talking about the importance of not starting first with structure when your organization needs to change. 
you have to first look at things like culture and your people when it comes to the change and your structure should follow that. And I think this is a very interesting um, and simple conversation to follow. But the challenge is, especially if you've had success, what happens is the, the initial concept of a service or a product that you started out with, the capability you built to go after that concept, and the culture that sort of evolved all fall into amazing gear, right? After all, you were successful. It is because your culture, your mm -hmm. capability, and concept are all firing on all cylinders, and you're doing super well. But the problem is, at some point, that concept you started with will run out of gas. You now need a new concept. That new concept will need new capability. And that's hard, mostly because culture will not let you build that new capability. OK. Hey, you know, I'd love to get reaction in the chat from that quote. I feel it's one of the most simple, almost master the obvious quotes. But if it were, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And Satya and Ajay at MasterCard both knew that for their organizations to adapt, to, to have a new concept and to become, in a, to, to become, if you would, and remain innovation leaders, that they had to start with culture. And what Satya was talking about is every firm here, so every firm on the planet that is going some going through some type of transformation, whether they're going from product centric to solution centric as a sales model, whether they are digitizing their business, maybe they're a hotelier that's saying we've got to drive up customer experience and we're going to totally digitize what that inner that experience looks like. Right. Getting back to Marcus's model, early, uh, you know, outline earlier of the types of change that organizations go through. Right. Whatever that is, it's going to require new capability, new capability technologically, new capability from a human standpoint, because the work that needs to get done to support that transformation is going to evolve. It's going to change. And in today's day and age, just like it took a pandemic to, we, to usher in wide scale acceptance of flexible work or hybrid work, it took chat GPT making the headlines for everyone to get off of the sofa and stand up or out of the hole and stand up looking around to say, what in the world just hit us? What do we need to be doing right now in preparing for generative AI? I have spoken to so many corporate boards of director members, and they hand over fist when I'm asking them things like, what do you need more from your head of HR? They will say things specific to, we need to know what is our firm doing to prepare for the fourth industrial revolution? And how, where are we running risk? And where is there opportunity based upon capability we have that we can really elevate? And so this is really, really important and cannot be under, uh, uh, under emphasized enough. And I'm just looking here real quick. I see Mahendra put in a very thoughtful uh, chat and I don't know if people are allowed to come off mute or not, but if you are, I'd love to have Mahindra. I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Uh, you want him to come on now, right now? Well, why not? Okay, hang on. Let me just see. I think Mahindra can unmute himself. Oh, okay. And if he can't, I'll just continue on, Bissy. I was just, uh, I think he put a audible? very thoughtful. Yeah. Are you there? I think he joined. Am I audible, Bissy? Yes, very much. Go ahead. I think that's a very good question you asked. 
yeah yeah it comes from the experience uh, yeah it's a personal experience so i just thought of sharing it so it's very self explanatory what i have written there just now so you know in my experience uh, uh, organizational restructuring decisions sometime are done in haste you know uh, because when the company is not doing in terms of uh, you know profit well in terms of profit so they just go with the terminology it is all about uh, organizational restructure and the result of it is you know it's it's, it's mostly cutting the costs and sometimes you know you cut uh, the manpower in the organization and you know a, a specialist who is performing a particular performance uh, his job is cut down and it is been added to somebody else who is not uh, actually trained into it that kind of an experience uh, i have come across and after a couple of years with the change of the management in the same organization the new management new director who reevaluated such decisions and said that it is impacting the business because the competition is doing differently hmm. so that was my you know it just happened a couple of months back when i was called back to you know give my opinion about uh, what decision was taken couple of years back and what competition is doing so you know therefore is somewhere i think kevin pointed out that uh, organizational restructuring is not uh, is not often the solution but the people are the solution so especially the companies who are doing quite well they should be very careful about whenever the such decisions are taken about restructuring the organization it should be studied in you know uh, in a wide spectrum you know the impact of restructuring the organization in terms of manpower growth business profit and vis-a-vis -vis competition is very important because it's all about competition in the market finally every company want to serve the customer and want to retain the loyal customer so these are my thoughts now mahendra thank you so much for sharing your thoughts i you know i um it really is it, it, it it's just a good example of what really matters so much um, and, and in today's day and age, the, the talent war, the ability to attract and retain the capability that the organization is going to need. And I'm not talking again, technology. Technology has its role for sure. But technology is also going to augment a lot of work and the capability of people to be able to work with that technology in a manner that they're not fearful of it but know that this is an assistant to them that can make their decisions, let's say, better or allow them to, to uh, be more impactful, more strategic in what they're working on is critical. And But if they're fearful, let's say, of the technology, then that's a problem. They're going to find something else. If the company, and, and so much of that comes down to the culture of the firm, does, we've done so much research on agility and what we know hands down and I can I can name three different studies we've done over the last seven years and it continuously shows that at high performance organizations the mentality of leaders is that they embrace change they look to change as a normal part of business and so they're constantly evolving because they know that if they don't evolve their company cannot evolve why? Because it gets back to what Satya is talking about. If you have a new concept, it requires new capability, but oftentimes the culture won't let you build that capability. And I believe what Satya is hitting upon here is the leader will not adjust the way they lead. They will not impact. Let's say if you want to be a more agile firm and you need to empower your people to make more decisions, the leader is afraid they don't trust the workers enough. And they need to be more hands-on. Well, people don't want that. They want to be empowered. They want greater autonomy. And if the leader doesn't support that, then that, that the people who demand greater control and autonomy, they'll leave, for example. And so what I thought would be very helpful here, and this really starts to tie it together, is go back to this model. And I'm going to share with you just a few things. So um, this is a quote 
that we put within that guidebook I referenced earlier, we created a guidebook on how to restructure, but I wanna share with you what the head of HR and operations for Gilead Sciences, this is a US based, very prominent uh, pharmaceutical company um, was talking about. And she said, the biggest thing to do in an HR, let's say transformation, is to assess your organization's maturity and that you must move your work into a model where you have the right people with the right skills doing the right work. Now that may seem <laughs> very master the obvious, but what happens is, is oftentimes when people think about what their strategy is, they're not thinking about, well, we just changed our strategy. What are the implications on the work that needs to get done? What are the implications on the skills required to get that work done? And how does our culture support that? And do we have the talent that addresses that? And if not, do we have the skilling? Do we have the internal skilling development uh, in place? Or getting back to what Marcus shared, and I sent everyone a link to this, a different ecosystem type of model. Do you have relationships with various sources that allow you to get the capability you need, either internally or externally, to address the needs at hand? And that is the systematic way of thinking. Here's another one, and this is from Diachi Sankyo over in Japan. This is another company that contributed to our, our uh, um, HR structuring guidebook, but we interviewed uh, thoroughly around this. And I love what they were saying is you move from strategy to the ideal structure that will enable the strategy. Focus on the roles you need now in the future and resist the urge to think about people. I think oftentimes too many companies immediately start thinking of who don't we want to lose? That's not the right way to think about it. You've got to be thinking about the critical roles that execute our strategy today. Are those roles going to be the same that are, to, that are going to be critical to executing our new strategy going forward? And then you start looking at the skills and capabilities required of those roles. And then you can start looking at the people piece because it's vastly much more around the capability, not necessarily individual people in that regard. And, and I wanted to show you how this really comes to life. So here's a conversation that I had earlier this week. I was traveling on business and I had the good fortune to have a, uh, excuse me, a dinner meeting with the chief executive officer of a, uh, a professional services firm that has close to 50,000 uh, people in their, in their company globally. It's a very large global firm. And during that conversation, I asked the chief executive, what was he being pressed most on by his board chair? And he said, it's really simple. And I want to pull this back to that productivity conversation we had, or that I started this with. He said, my board, he said, think about this. We're a multi-billion dollar company, US billion dollar company. And he said, right now, our current workforce is producing about 90%, producing at about 90%. He said, I know that we can't produce at 100% because that just is, that's not tenable. That's not possible. But the board chair is asking me, what, what must we do in order to get it from 90% to 93%? And when you think about productivity, there's really only two answers in a people-related business like professional services. You either add more headcount or you get more from your current worker. And so the CEO came back to me and I asked him, and I think this is one of the most simple yet powerful questions that every executive needs to be asking and staying on whenever there's a significant change, especially a change in strategy. So I went back to the CEO and I said, 
let's call that person Thomas. I said, hey, Thomas, what must be true for you to be able to generate 93% versus 90% from your workforce? And that was a really interesting conversation because one of the things he first mentioned was we hire about 10,000 people a year in professional services. He said, we have a 19% attrition rate. So what must be true for us to go from 90 to 93% with our existing workforce is we have to decrease that attrition rate. And I said, yeah, that's one thing, okay? Let's just take that one. And I said, Thomas, what must be true for you to be able to decrease that attrition? And he thought, and he said, that's a really good question. And so we ended up having a conversation. He started going down the path of compensation. And I said, do you pay a competitive wage? And he said, we do. And I said, okay, so if, if, if you're paying a competitive wage, what, what must be true other than that in order to decrease that attrition? And he said, well, here's why people are leaving us. He said, we're finding that we're not having enough opportunity to advance beyond a certain realm. And I said, okay, are you going to, so what must be true in order for you to offer more advancement? And so we ended up having a very detailed conversation and, I, and, and it really got him starting to think about things like internal mobility, versus creating more hierarchy, which was sort of the question that he wanted. You can't create more hierarchy just to give more people advancement. So we started talking about internal mobility and the variety of exposure and experiences that he could be able to provide his people. And would that do something to continue the motivation and keep people seeing development beyond just upward mobility? We started talking about things like time to productivity for new hires. They were hiring 10,000 people a year. How long did it take for someone coming in to be contributing at a high level of, of, of output for their firm? And what if they could shrink that by 10% and thus get people producing more quicker and that's not an area he had thought about, which was revamping their onboarding process. But all of that started having cultural implications. So, you know, these are questions. We didn't go through necessarily these questions, but these questions here that I'm showing you are ones that when your firms go through significant change, we know that if you're asking these on a regular basis, you are going to be vastly more equipped. So I wanna go back to what I had mentioned earlier. The, the board chair that I spoke with that said, Kevin, I really wish that our head of HR could answer this question. What are we doing to prepare our workforce for the fourth industrial revolution? Where do we have risk and where do we have opportunity? If that head of HR was thinking about, well, we know where our strategy is evolving, what must be true for that strategy to succeed and start asking questions like, how will the work change? What roles will be critical tomorrow versus today? What are the skills and capabilities required to get that work done? And where do we have gaps internally? How are we going to develop those internally? And where does that present opportunity for us? And who do we or where do we need to pull capability from partnering with our customers, maybe doing a talent swap to partnering with startups and maybe shifting out some capability to a startup that your firm now has the opportunity to invest in? If, for instance, they come up with, uh, you know, new concepts under an NDA that helps uh, both firms advance. What about partnerships with apprenticeships or universities? government and academia, 
What about crowdsourcing? And Marcus had talked about a company that be up. What about crowdsourcing and finding capability there versus you know, limiting yourself to what you've got internally? And so all of these questions allow a firm to be much more agile, to be much more anticipatory of what needs to happen. And when they, when they go through an exercise like this, they then need to ask themselves, how clear are we on what needs to get done to realize the truths that we have outlined? And then that's where you could start saying, okay, from a skills and capabilities and structure perspective, what structure is going to be needed to support the culture that we need going forward? How do we need to structure our work processes in order to allow line leaders to pull capability from other sources than traditional managed service providers and RPO that they're working with, or just the graduate schools that they're recruiting from over and over again, and have, you know, the, the talent pools aren't growing there. So that's where you need to start thinking about how you can restructure once you've answered questions like this. And so here's what we know. These are key questions to consider when designing structure. And these come from the toolkit I alluded to. What does the new model add to your organization's business strategy that the old model didn't or, or, or wouldn't? When and how will the stakeholders that you're supporting experience these benefits? And that is really working with those stakeholders to have them understand the why behind the change that's going into effect. And you can work with them and and, and identifying what the key indicators to that change are going to be so that you could better understand how successful that's happening. Okay. Now, another question is what are the new and improved deliverables HR be able to provide to the organization to execute that strategy? Now, this is a really important one because oftentimes HR gets dinged. In other words, it's a negative thing at companies when they're proposing a new program to the business. The business doesn't understand why it matters, what the, you know, what the, what the problem it's looking to solve, and what the impact they should anticipate and what their role in that change is and how, again, to measure the, uh, the success of them. And so you've got to be able to understand and think that through. What are the key processes that are improved through the structure and when will those changes take place? How will the new model improve the organization's capability to have the talent and skills it needs? So in other words, you know, going back again to the structure piece, if you think about the capability piece, if, there, if you need new capability, and I want to go back to Satya Nadella, and Satya says, culture will not let you build that new capability. So think about if you're taking HR business partners and you want to, you want to align them more closely with the businesses, let's say. Or maybe it's you sense tension between your centers of expertise and your HR business partners. How are you alleviating that tension? So the business doesn't experience that and it provides much greater fluidity and a, a much greater experience for the business. You might wanna rethink about creating some type of role that allows better synergy between the COEs and the HR business partner. I'm just saying that that's an example of where a change in structure makes really good sense. How does the structure align with the processes to support the culture and the business strategy? This all follows through. Now, I want to just go back here for a minute. And Bissy, I know that I'm taking up a little bit more time than I, than I promised. I just want to end with a couple of other thoughts here. But are there any questions or comments from anyone on, on what's been discussed? Curious to get your thoughts. I think there were some comments. And Kevin, do you want to release your poll? No, I don't think that's important. I think we're all good, Bissy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yep. Okay, so uh, nothing. I think there was okay. a comment from somebody saying data leakage or something. 
Okay. Hey, I, I wanted to end with this. And, you know, Bissy had asked me to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, timing and workspaces. I think one of the most important things anyone needs to think about right now is flexibility. And research on the right is when uh, we conducted research and we asked, what are the elements in your organization's employee value proposition that are proven to attract talent successfully? You can see that among high performance organizations, 80% said flexibility in work arrangements versus only 44% of low performance organizations. You can see coaching and mentoring from leaders. And this is so critical. If you wanna train, if you wanna modify training or dig deep in training at your firm, where you're gonna get the best payoff, our research shows, is equipping your people leaders on how to set clear goals and how to provide forward looking developmentally oriented feedback regularly to their employees. And then of course you should teach your employees how to receive that feedback. So it's not resistant. But what I wanted to share is flexibility is really big. But oftentimes companies are getting stuck in one area of flexibility and it's a huge mistake. So if flexibility is table stakes now, you've got to think beyond the where. And I wanna give you this example. Here in the United States, this was, this was um, publicized around the world last fall. The United States as a country almost came to, clo to a closure back in the fall of 2022 because there was a threat among the nation's railroad unionized workers to stop working. That would have been cataclysmic from supply chain um, disruptions, et cetera, energy disruptions, you name it. The reason why they unionized rail workers were so close to striking, and it took the White House in the United States to intervene on this, was because the railroads were refusing to allow the workers to have paid sick leave. Now, this all changed earlier this year. One new CEO at one of the most prominent railroads in the United States, this railroad's called CSX. They brought in a new CEO and that CEO decided that they needed to lead from a cultural standpoint and shake things up. And so he personally worked with the unions of his railroad and they approved paid sick leave for six of their largest unions. Now, soon after that, many other railroads in the United States followed and offered that. That is flexibility beyond the wear of work. And in doing so, I personally believe you're going to see CSX on the forefront of being one of the more successful railroads if it's not already. And so I'm gonna check here and chat because there's a few conversations. Okay, so nothing that I need to, to address it looks like. I just wanted to, 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 to really hit upon that. But here's what I also wanted to hit upon. We have conducted so far this year, two very significant global studies, one on culture health, one on productivity. And here's what we know. Culture health, the health of a company's culture, explains nearly 20% of the variance of an organization's productivity. We also know that trust, trust in leadership, and trust among workers explains 19% of productivity that companies have experienced since the start of the pandemic. So culture and trust themselves explain at least a fifth of productivity variance among companies. So when it comes to what organizations should do to build that trust component and build a healthy culture, you've got to be training your leaders how to behave, how, how their behaviors, what they look like to reflect the culture that you need, to reflect the desired values that the company has or the stated values the company has, 
You can see here, this is from our latest research. You're among the first to see this. There are four effective manager traits that are very common among high performance organizations and also make a big difference, a very big difference when it comes to trust at a company. And again, trust is a major driver of productivity. Managers have a clear understanding of organization's goals. They're held accountable for the achievement of their team's goals. They're effective at helping people, individuals set goals, and they're effective at coaching individuals. So that's where an organization should be spending their time on a training standpoint. And Bessie, I'll turn things back to you. Yes, uh, thanks, Kevin. An amazing presentation. And I must say that I think all of us are stunned with the amount of knowledge and information that we have seen forthcoming from both of you, Marcus and Kevin. Thank you so much. Now we shall take and uh, now we shall ask Dr. Sandeep to talk. He's going to talk about his favorite topic, which is productivity vis-a-vis -vis mental health. Here we go. Thank Dr. you, Sandeep, Thank Michael. You. Yeah, I yeah, I'll share the screen. Yeah, so I'd be just talking uh, briefly yeah, about Dr. mental just, health. Just uh, put it on slideshow. If you could just put it on slideshow. Oh because yeah, I'll do that. Uh, yeah. uh, you know okay. the PowerPoint slideshow. Uh, yeah, I'm using this. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. One second, eh? Mm. Just use the slideshow option, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I see the button here, right here. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm using the MacBook, sir. <laughs> so, oh, will okay. I be able to do that here? <laughs> okay. Let me see. Uh, there should be some option, but I'm. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, like the option. It's yeah, the yeah, same it's, icon. It's, it's the, the same icon. MacBook is the same icon. Don't worry. Just do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There, yeah, there yeah, we go. Now you're able to see okay. the slide, no? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I just want to say something uh, about briefly about mental health and how this uh, organization restructuring can affect mental health of employees and the stress related uh, depressive and anxiety symptoms then is symptoms that people can uh, develop because of this changes in their job, especially when they're not sure what changes will happen in the company that they're working in and when the changes will happen, what the changes will be happen. There will be role conflict and role ambiguity, role overload, and uh, it can result in total confusion and so much of stress among the employees. So about what is mental health, the basic things that we always say about as WHO defines health is a state of basically uh, health overall is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not uh, merely the absence of disease or infirmity. We can add spiritual component also if needed. The WHO uh, describes uh, it as a state of well-being in which a, every individual realizes his or her own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. So, uh, mental health is not just merely the absence of any mental disorders or mental illness per se, but they would be they should be able to contribute fruitfully and productively, especially in the context that we're talking about, fruitfully and productively to the company that they are working with. Even Ghana, when is uh, it is saying about the nine future of work trends in 2023, says about uh, addressing employee mental well-being. So if the mental health is not taken care of adequately, the productivity will go down in no time. And about mental health, of course, as we all know, there are many factors. Usually we simply try to say in a nutshell, like nature versus nurture. So nature is the genetic factors here. Uh, the genetic factors here and nurture, that is the environmental factors, the upbringing and the, all the other environmental factors are there. So genetic factors are, of course, there. Hereditary genes and gene mutations and 
uh, family history of mental health problems and so many things like that are there. But uh, despite all that, many a time it would be the environmental factors which would be playing a much major role to trigger off uh, many mental health problems, especially depressive episodes and anxiety disorders. And even it can result in personality changes, many behavioral problems, interpersonal problems like that. And even it can lead to substance abuse and uh, that can lead to many other mental health problems, including even psychosis and <laughs> Uh, family problems and so many things like that. So even in this, um, genetic factors are there in one corner, and there are personal factors and lifestyle, lifestyle, uh, lifestyle choices. Uh, I don't want to just uh, you know enumerate. You can see the slide and make out how uh, all things play a vital role and, and how uh, you know. Many a time, in each person's case, uh, it would be different factors that would be playing the role. Even uh, substance use uh, is also mentioned over here. Occupational factors are there, traumatic events in life, and occupational factors. Occupational factors is what is what we are mostly talking about today, and due pressures, poorly defined job roles that easily can happen when organizational restructuring happens when suddenly everything is restructured and <laughs> people are wondering what they are really supposed to do, <laughs> whom they have to report to. and So lack of control over work so uh, and unhealthy work-life balance. Today, uh, I was talking to a nurse who came to consult me. She's working in UK. And she was telling me that her work-life balance there is very excellent. So much so that you know she gets a lot of free time, and she wonders how, how to spend this free time. And uh, when compared to how she was working here in India, so of course you know the work if, when there is uh, unhealthy work-life balance, how it affects the productivity, the quality of work, and poor relationships. Uh, organ Organizational change, as we, we were discussing, lack of variety in work can be very boring and monotonous sometimes to do the whole job without any, you know, no innovative things. Limited career development, the full potential of the individual is not really utilized. So all these things can affect mental health and how to motivate employees through this organizational change. It is not an easy task, but, uh, you know, I'll just briefly go through some slides where uh, even the general stress management things as well as some related to place can help us. And there is a huge impact and there are many research papers, many systematic reviews and meta-analysis and all who, which uh, say about this uh, relapse and onset of many depressive episodes, anxiety disorders, um, how all this role overload and everything can work uh, the uh, affect the work life, and this cognitive triangle is uh, something very simple uh, way in which I try to explain to uh, my clients, uh, even to even the most uneducated people also can understand simply uh, how our mind works when we simply explain this cognitive triangle, which is actually a contribution by Aaron Beck, who recently passed away, who is the proponent of the cognitive behavior therapy and cognitive behavior theory, uh, which is the backbone of that. So this cognitive triangle, thought, emotion, behavior, the interlinking and how it affects. So many a time people are were worried and anxious that is in the emotional realm the frustration the anxiety the fear the fear about the future and even uh, to fear you know even uh, stage fear and even to uh, fear anticipatory anxiety about the uh, what to say the work output and many things like that it will be reflected in the emotional realm uh, with those emotional problems mostly people present to us sometimes actually it will be uh, not sometimes, many, uh, you know, mostly it would be reflected in the behavior of them also in terms of anger outbursts, with irritability, interpersonal problems, and um, what is the absenteeism, and uh, so many things like that. And sometimes, uh, you know, going to substance use and that related that, uh, you know, uh, the problems related to that spectrum also comes into picture. And uh, many a time, this, uh, what to say, this thought realm is. Uh, is largely neglected. So, you know, what we 
when we counsel people, we see, of course, uh, a psychiatrist, uh, we do prescribe medicines and we try to help them to see things from a different perspective and uh, what is it, to see uh, th things from a healthy, long-term uh, perspective so that they, they would have, uh, you know, they would, they would have better control emotion and also what all things that they can change in their behavior in terms of uh, in their free time uh, have good hobbies uh, cultivating good interpersonal relationship even outside the workplace good friends and spending good time with the family being integrated with the community the family uh, uh, good quality time with family members especially with spouse, with children. Uh, so this uh, hobbies and uh, time with the quality time with friends and family, then exercise and uh, you know games and uh, social circle charity. On that, they can feel good and even actually even spiritual practices, uh, deep breathing exercises uh, like that will help in the overall emotional well-being of that person. So um, even when I try to explain the five steps of stress management, about the cognitive renewing, I was telling about this thought renewing, that is cognitive renewing is all about, uh, of course, in some of my previous presentations, as well as in my presentations, I have ex tried to explain uh, even in a spiritual way, uh, I usually use them see uh, some phrases, some seven, seven Generate phrases that start with C to uh, structuring what uh, CBT usually says. I uh, tend to use this my own term cognitive renewing. <laughs> uh, what to say, especially from a spiritual. If I would just uh, you know try to quickly elaborate, it's just uh, cast your burdens, count your blessings. Uh, we are crushed in a situation, in any situation to in order that we would be stronger enough in future to comfort even many other people who are going through many crushing experiences like we are going through now. So seeing a purpose behind our crushing, breaking uh, experiences and trials in life and uh, to be conformed to his likeness, that means actually just like if, uh, you know, if if some gold or silver is refined in fire, all the dross is melted away. So like that, when we are going through some fiery experiences, even in our job place or even in our personal life, to see that uh, it is as a sanctifying, as a uh, cleansing experience where uh, after the trial will come out, evolve as a better person as a bitter person <laughs> so if our ego and everything is uh, you know if we can forego for that uh, we can evolve as a better person after all so that are some of the c's that i would say uh, and then um, the psychological behavioral changes i was telling about the uh, uh, quality time with the family and not in the physical exercise part we can add some healthy diet also in that physical exercise, as we all know, uh, releases endorphins, which are some of the happy hormones in our system. Uh, physical exercise, especially when it, when, when it is exposed to sunlight, sunlight uh, will help us to produce more vitamin D. Vitamin D fluctuations are also notorious to produce this mood swings and all. And of course, healthy diet, which uh, uh, what is it, when we are, where we are ensuring uh, healthy intake of vitamins and minerals, especially vitamin B12 levels, hemoglobin levels and all are very crucial in our mental health well-being and all. So healthy diet, all in good balance. And then pharmacologically if needed, uh, you know, many a time actually with healthy lifestyle, with good counseling, with good social support, not only social support, but support within the uh, what to say then the work environment it's all uh, pay, all uh, go a long way in helping the employees and sometimes actually uh, there is uh, no need for any hesitation to take any small uh, antidepressants or some lot of anxiolytics and all if needed some supplements uh, some uh, psychotropic medicines to help us feel better and to more uh, more stress free and people would be very 
or to say very suspicious about the side effects and all but um, actually now it is uh, you know god's grace so much of good research and good molecules have or have are there where uh, there are good medicines which will which have kind of almost nil significant side effects where, you know if we can uh, you know each uh, person uh, according to their profile if we prescribe the right dose of medicines at the right time the right molecule uh, you know they can do really well and can uh, what to say can use more to, more of the potential uh, in their work uh, with the help of medicines as needed so this is again from something from gardner human deal framework they are also you see i feel understood i feel autonomous i feel valued i feel cared for i feel invested <laughs> but a holistic approach uh, i feel understood there are deeper connections self employees strengthen their family and community yeah. connections not just work it is not just work that is all life is about but uh, you know there is a holistic view you are not just an employee but you are a person as a whole Uh, in medical terms we say don't treat patients as cases but as individuals <laughs> so it is not just a case of some uh, depression but it is an individual who has some depressive symptoms <laughs> so like that, uh, that uh, there will be more of an empathy more of connectedness uh, which will go a long way so i feel autonomous there is radical flexibility as uh, my previous presenters kevin and marcus and all were pointing out you know how this flexibility and all can work performance provide flexibility now on all at scope for personal growth i feel value it is not just i'm being exploited in the company for their own gains alone because uh, i am part of and i do share my part but there is a where i'm i'm growing Uh, personally i am part of this company help employees grow as people not just as professionals and holistic well being ensure employees use don't just provide holistic well being offerings uh, they use that also uh, so i feel cared for so i feel invested here shared purpose take collective action on purpose not just make uh, statements you know it is collective action and about that there is this uh, again from gartner how to increase Uh, management success uh, changes management success there is this top down change and there is this open source change and it is obvious what is more effective in top down change it is just the leaders setting the change strategy here the employees work the change decision uh, and uh, here leaders the implementation plan here the organizations on communication camp bits here employees talk openly about change they are more free and more flexible yes. and how this all can really help uh, them to cope up with the stress of organizational restructure so mental health uh, as we can as it is very evident uh, cannot be neglected and uh, proper scrutiny proper uh, uh, you know uh, proper interventions proper screening and all will help and whenever needed counseling and whenever needed further the reference to psychiatrists and all are nothing to be stigmatized but had to be rather encouraged so that's my small bit of contribution thank you now open to questions for all the yes yes that was an amazing session and we i think we we've covered all the topics that we talked about uh we had marcus who talked about ai ml organizational hierarchies we had kevin covering all the topics that we broadlined in our webinar we had we had dr sandeep talking about everything connected to productivity and mental health amazing session i think i'm going to give that a huge applause thank you so much and now we shall leave the session open for an open forum q and a So, if anybody in the audience wants to come on board and talk, uh, ask a question, you're most welcome. You can unmute yourself, or you could put a question in the chat.
Hi, this is Naval Vaswani from Karachi. Uh, my apology is uh, as I was a bit late uh, in the sessions because of uh, some personal commitment. Uh, so I was unable to, you know, attend uh, earlier sessions uh, and uh, the organization's restructured by probably it was a given, so half of them. Eh? But I enjoyed fully the sessions uh, uh, by, by uh, Dr. Sandeep. Dr. Sandeep, uh, 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 as as um, mental health is in a state of uh, you know is in a state of uh, it is a branch of medical science right and if i look at the numbers of the people who provide these qualified opinions informed and uh, you know qualified uh, uh, treatment uh, the number of the psychiatrist uh, is is in, in particularly in the third world countries like india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka and and also this is valid for other developed countries as well so it's the ratio is one to five hundred thousand. So how do you think? Mm -hmm. How do I mean a whole country of Pakistan is of the two hundred thirty million people, and we have only four hundred thirty-two psychiatrists. Now you can calculate it. So my point is, uh, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, uh, leveraging the technology, leveraging the modern methodology of, uh, uh, you know, access, mm -hmm. reach, uh, management. So what do you suggest? I mean, uh, uh, because we are discussing, I'm working, uh, I'm not a medical professional, but as a management professional, so I'm working since last six months to 12, 12 months with all the psychiatrists and these healthcare you know, professionals. Now, how to scale it up? I mean, otherwise, um, you know, only the selected, the elite will have the access to, uh, you know, this, mm -hmm. uh, this service. So, so, the, so the very phenomena, you know, the access to health is compromised. I mean, I will not have, uh, if I'm unable to pay, I will not be the access. So how you tackle it and what is your solutions would be so that we can adapt uh, for the greater gain of humanity and society and particularly the people in need. I don't know, about Dr. Sandeep, it is a random maybe, but yeah, it, yeah, it, it was no popping up. Yeah. yeah, it's a very relevant question. and. Um... I also feel really concerned, especially for this third world countries where this proportion and even in India, uh, uh, you know, uh, in some parts of India where there are a much more good issue of psychiatrists and population and some rural parts and all, uh, much of it is neglected and uh, even actually people without any qualifications, quarks and so many, what to say, even kind of magicians or black magicians are taking over the troll and, you know, so much of uh, confusion and so much of chaos in so many parts of the world, uh, of course, especially in underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped parts of uh, the nation. So, of course, there is no easy solution because actually from the political level, they have to increase the number of postgraduate seats in psychiatry and there should be good quality institutions to train people and all. But one thing that uh, is that's happening, especially after COVID uh, is or during and after COVID is about the rapid globalization <laughs> where you know the internet has really connected even before that internet was connecting all parts of the world but i feel uh, as a professional uh, i feel more connected to much more parts of the world <laughs> after uh, you know with and after covid of course covid has uh, shown so much of disaster all over the world but one thing that has happened is that this even the Zoom platform <laughs> became much more planned, you know, much more popular uh, with the onset of uh, COVID and all. So like that, even nowadays, so many people from many parts of the world are contacting even a, you know, not as a, uh, not that a well-known psychiatrist like me. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm to get a consultation from Pakistan, but uh, <laughs> of course from, uh, you know, uh, even from Bangladesh and uh, uh, many, many uh, other parts, actually, uh, you know, many parts of even from the rural North India and uh, even, of course, from other, even from states and UK and Gulf countries and so many uh, Australia and so many parts, we get uh, online considerations where we are able to um, give them good quality advice and if needed medicines, uh, 
um, are being courier from my clinic to many parts of the world got by lord spray so what i'm saying is that uh, not only me but there are many uh, online consultation things like that are available but uh, as you uh, say many people who are poor and uh, educated and all are not able to access but from this organizational point of view and all i mean we people who are uh, available on online platforms can be made use of by any company owners or managers uh, anywhere in the world uh and uh, so i mean actually with the with, we can make use of technology and uh, can utilize uh, what to say quality services from across the world uh, thanks to internet facilities but, but, and but that is sandeep sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt i yeah. mean um, um, um but dr sandeep is only one we we will not be having the uh, until we will not be having the clones of the dr sandeep <laughs> either he will be available in the clinics either he will be available virtually on the internet the question uh, in the data is same i i went through the data of india the ratio is still same and yeah, and the yeah. second thing is the second thing is uh, particularly after post covid uh, we are uh, hyperactive and uh, you know everybody is uh, having the free suggestion so we everybody is become the researcher as well uh, so this yeah. is good thing i was mm-hmm. also reading uh, you know a couple of days back uh, the research uh, you know uh, from the gallup probably and i dropped a message to the ceo of gallup as well you see the two mm-hmm. indexes the negativity index and the positivity index i mean it is mm-hmm. not a simple thing the negativity mm-hmm. index has increased even one point more right and he has mentioned and uh, the gallup ceo has mentioned i will i will be sharing uh, uh, to mr bc the, the report and uh, she can share to the participant he has mentioned a, and a statement in the topic you know the heading of this article is the bigger pandemic has arrived in the world bigger than the covid 19 81% of the people are having this mental health issue mm. right and the problem second problem is we we have we have we have not the realization even as well in third world countries we are living with the stigmas and taboos even as well i don't know people are uh, you know uh, hindi or urdu samajh payenge ya nahi to hum to pagal hain kya to hmm. this is a taboo i mean if i have a mental disorder i mean, whatever under the classification of mental health to main main to bada worried hu main non professional hu main marne se pehle i want to live this world a better place before dying and i want to exclusively work and dr sandeep i will i would love to uh, seek your guidance i am connected with the top of the top uh, secretary staff of the country in few from the global side as well until we will not open it up and the third thing is problem is uh, uh, it's not only the number of secretaries half of them are even even worse than any anybody else because they don't know just they pro- provide the tranquilizers and and uh, you know the dizzy pump sort of things they don't treat even they don't know how to treat i'm sorry uh, uh, my conversation uh, went a bit higher but it, yeah. it the topic was uh, I, even i was i was very much interested for this restructuring because i am on the board of an organization i'm in the process of restructuring so i mm-hmm. i don't know um, may i request uh, taking this opportunity from kevin that i may i be connected on the linkedin to seek the guidance because uh, we are facing some critical uh, uh, problem in a, in a microfinance bank where the restructuring is a problem uh, we are facing four problems uh, uh, what to do with the uh, legacy oriented employees and what to uh, do for the future because the the future of work is 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 reshaping every day uh, and ai chat gpt and other platforms has um, uh, is like a fuel on the fire on the positive side so uh, i will be connected kevin with you and i i am uh, as a professional as a learner i will humbly request uh, for your guidance and i would love to you know be the part of any any other session as well so i don't know third one i missed totally uh, and i will go and receive the recording i totally uh, i i i really appreciate congratulate and um, i'm humbled and thankful from the bottom of my heart to the busy and all the speakers for their valuable time i tell you this is the most precious asset in today's world is a knowledge you guys are doing tremendous work and it is uh, you know sparing your knowledge uh, it, 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 sharing your knowledge and is you know sharing your time god bless you keep all smiling keep all inspiring keep all shining you are actually the heroes of humanity 
I'm saying as a professional from the from the core of my heart. It's not all the words. Actually, my 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 emotions are actually my my the pumping of heart is actually the rhythm of heart is this. I mean, these are the people. I I don't believe anything else. So you you are the genuinely um, you know transforming the 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 mindset of the people. I really I'm very humbled and I'm really thankful. You made my weekend. God bless you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Naval. That is, I think, one of the most uh, voracious thanks and gratitude we've ever seen. Thank you okay. so much. Uh-huh. Okay, there is a. We have to move forward. Unfortunately, we would love to hear more and more appreciation, but I think we'll just thank you so much, Naval. Okay, now there is a question uh, from Janice. She asks. Uh, she's. She has asked. Uh, Kevin, did you get that? I think I you did. I did. Oh, I did, right? Uh, yeah, but Janice and uh, oh, are you ref- yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I I think I I think pretty clearly what they're talking about are, you know, reductions in force, you know, and how how you know how best to manage those to to the best of your ability to ensure culture strength, let's say. And and what I would what I would say, it's, it's really interesting. You know, there is someone, and I, I, I just contributed to an article in the Wall Street Journal um, this past week, and the writer read, you know, reached out to me and said, We're, I, I, I'm going to be writing an article on, on people and human resources who are being laid off, and what's your, what's your best advice to them on what to do next? And so, you know, I contributed to that. I, I, uh, I would encourage everyone to read it. I think it was a very insightful article. It was in their workplace report on, I think, Thursday of this past week. But I put her in touch with someone who is an HR professional who is working for a company called Wayfair. And this HR professional back in the fall of last year contacted me, I happened to know her, but she contacted me and said, Kevin, um, I was just let go at Wayfair, you know, and uh, I've already got offers for other employment, but, you know, I ended up, actually, I ended up contracting with her for a couple of months because I asked if she would be interested when she was with a, a very large global beverage company, she built their upskilling program. And I said, interesting, we're building an, up, an upskilling toolkit. Can I contract with you for two months between your downtime and have you contribute to this to make sure it's as relevant as possible? And she did an outstanding job and she loved it because it took her kind of out of her comfort zone a little bit working. She had never been with a research firm, but she got to work on a tool that she knows now is going to impact hundreds of organizations. But what was interesting is the way she found out about the layoff, she woke up one morning, was going to work, and she got emails from two of her directs. And the email said, Tina, we've been let go. Why didn't we get a heads up? And Tina was like, what are you talking about? I, I'm not aware of this. I didn't know. But the, she said, then 15 minutes later, I got an email saying I was being let go. And so this company, Wayfair, Wayfair let go of 900 employees through email. No one had any kind of notice. And, you know, to me, it's the epitome of a company that is not thinking through the ramifications of their actions. Now, what they should be thinking through are things that we wrote about. I I wrote an article for the Financial Times a couple of years ago, and it was in their quote unquote, responsible investing special edition. And what I did is I, I, focus the article on what we call the new corporate currency. And at the time, what we posited was your organization's purpose has never mattered more. Your purpose is why you do what you do. And it needs to resonate with the people, the talent that you're looking to attract and retain. 
but your purpose needs to be supported by your culture. And your culture, for the most part, is what people experience through what's rewarded, what's condoned, what's tolerated, what's condemned, you name it. And your culture is going to dictate your brand. And your brand on the employment side is how people talk about you. And you can't dictate your employment brand. It's being dictated for you. But you can affect your employment brand based upon the decisions you make that speak to your culture. And laying off workers with no notice, with their direct supervisor having no idea and letting them go through an email, what do you think is being discussed about that company in the social sphere? Are those people going to others saying, hey, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you apply here? Are they, are they writing ratings out there? And those glass door ratings, those comparably ratings, eh, sometimes, you know, maybe companies might be able to manipulate those by paying those companies a little bit. But you know what? More importantly, everyone who's looking for a job is going there and figuring out what do people have to say about them? And they're not thinking it through. And so the best advice that we have for companies is if you have to let people go, let them go in, a, in as human a way possible that you can, legally as well, but you better be communicating to the people who are left. Those who are left are gonna feel, number one, there's all kinds of fear, uncertainty, and doubt going on in their minds. The viability of the firm, was this fair letting that person go? They're going to watch and see how the firm treats those people who are gone and say, you know what? If you do it well and they understand the rationale, we're having to make these decisions for these reasons. Um, so what I would say is the how about the how of how a company goes about it and what they end up communicating has tremendous impact. And you've got to be thinking through that. And I, we can go on and on. And I see Naval has his hand up. I don't know if there's anything you want to contribute to this, Naval, or not. But you know, uh, that's my initial reaction. Yeah, Naval wants to say something? Yeah, quickly, uh, so that other participants may have the opportunity. Uh, yeah, uh, Kevin, Kevin, there are two things. One is a short comment and it could trigger a new discussion. So we will keep <laughs> on this discussion, maybe the later part. Uh, I have thought a lot on, on the effect and the impacts and the aftershocks of the capitalism. The very concept of capitalism originated from maximize the profit of, of shareholder. If we change it from shareholder to stakeholder, it will resolve half of the problem. But unfortunately, the capitalism works on the efficiency. So efficiency means how to produce one more unit. So they consider human resources the most valuable part, asset, as a burden when organizations in the problem. It's like if, if they consider as a stakeholder, society as a stakeholder, as a family, even I, if I die, I won't let go my son or my kids or my family. Once you think in that perspective, and particularly the HR, if you think in that perspective, 70% problem will, by default, will be resolved. Number two, uh, I mean, this is, this is the half, uh, you know, the misery you have defined. There is another, uh, you know, probably the 70% of misery is what? In the world of inflation, in the world of, uh, you know, rising prices, you know, we have come up with a, with a new jargon, with the new buzzwords, right? So um, uh, these buzzwords are not solutions to any misery. For example, in our part of the world, particularly in the rest of the world in general, it happens. The cost of living is increased, but the salaries and the wages are not increased. Can you imagine uh, Dr. Sandeep is, is here? I mean, the impact, I, I was just yesterday talking to my psychiatrist that what is the impact of the low wage on the mental health of the employees and there should be research. The average average amount to live a basic fourth grade life equal to a, a, just you know two centimeters above the animal. 
is probably 30000 uh, you know in our uh, in our uh, you know currency is a $30000 but the bare minimum salary is 20000 and how these people their people will compromise on what health education kids well being entertainment right and just they or they survive on on and filling their stomach with the, with the, with the something non nutritious so i mean where are the governments where are the regulators they are the partner in crime or what they have to come up with a, with a make the regulations right and they are actually the the, 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 the bigger crime uh, you know what i can say the bigger criminal are the governments and the regulators they have to intervene you see what happens if you look we have mama companies mama is what meta alphabet microsoft and these four they have 50 percent of the world resources six trillion dollar to ten trillion dollars of the valuation and four billions of the people half of the population is lesser than that you know how it is happening i mean i'm not pointing out any country or any culture or any company the very structure has come up with a with a real shape of problems for the humanity and number two the second problems now they are crying because their very survival of the customer is at the danger otherwise they would have continued it what they have done over the years with the environment with the mother nature with the water with the oxygen this is these are the shared resources of the world i tell you i am from a country where carbon emission is less than 0.3 percent but i am i'm paying the price with a heavy flood with a you know with with a high temperature 53 degrees centigrade can you imagine 53 degrees centigrade for seven months the average centigrade is 41 degrees centigrade can you imagine right but we have uh, you know in the word of uh, the ceo of nokia um, after 11th year of uh, the kingdom uh, of the market share of 45 percent uh, when they lost the, to the apple and the smartphone they said we did not do anything wrong but we lost and we are the third world countries are so saying we did not do anything wrong but we are paying the price in terms of floods in terms of environment so uh, i mean we uh, the bigger bigger uh, you know reshaking the bigger uh, transformation the big bang transformation is required in the structure otherwise 5 billion people will die down no naval I, I appreciate what you're what you just shared um I, i'll give two very brief responses to that and then i'll just I'll, I'll go back on mute and maybe this is part of what you and i continue discussion around um two things one is this is where we're seeing the you know sustainability has become you know sustainability is in most corporations something that they look at and connote more with like the environment and but what we're seeing at certain organizations is they're taking a much broader view of sustainability. I'll give you an example. So I want to go back to that model I shared earlier where I said, what must be true for the strategy to succeed? This is an exact paraphrase of a conversation I had with, one, with the head of sustainability with one of the top three global retailers. Um, and this was within the past year. And my question to that person was, do you anticipate with the e looming global economic recession that, there, that your firm's commitment to sustainability will be cut? In other words, funding, prioritization, et cetera. And she said, no. And we went through the exercise, why? And it very much aligned with what I was going with all of you before. So let me share with you how the conversation went. She said, every month, you know, the executive team gets together and she says, sustainability at our firm is not around just the environment. It's part of business sustainability. So she said, here's an example. What is one of the absolute truths at our firm? One of our absolute truths for us to be viable as a business going forward is that we have to operate in communities where we deliver value on a daily basis. She said, everyone in the executive team knows that that has to be true. Then the question is, is what has to be true for that to succeed? The answer to that 
she mentioned a couple. She said, one, we need to ensure that we have locally relevant people, workers that are skilled to work, motivated to work, and willing to work at the wages that will still provide us an operating margin we need. So that is where their talent piece really fits into that critical equation there. She said, further, we need to have locally relevant products on the store shelves at the prices that the people in this community, the communities can afford giving us the margins that we need. Thus, that's where their supplier diversity initiative fits in. And what I loved about that answer was they were, and I asked her, I said, so you view sustainability more like an overarching business. So in other words, in order for your firm to be viable and grow and competitive going forward, you see it where you have to have communities in which you are helping to grow and educate the talent, where you're paying a, a, a living wage or more, and where you are not affecting the environment negatively, because if you did, then the people cannot work because they're unhealthy or they're paying so much for healthcare where they can't afford your products. And you need to have diverse suppliers here. So you're helping underrepresented groups grow businesses and, and become part of these competitive bids that you're bidding on locally. And she said, you nailed it. That's to your point, Naval. She is looking at stakeholder, their firm, that's how they look at stakeholder capitalism without losing sight of shareholder value. But they can't forego their stakeholders, absent just the shareholders, just trying to drive value for the shareholder. And I believe that what we're going to see here is much more emphasis on this going forward, or hope as well. And I know we're we're at our time limit here, but I'll, I just wanted to comment on that. Thanks, yes, Kevin. I that was wonderful. Yeah, I think uh, I think we need to call it a day. Uh, sorry, guys. Thanks for joining in. Sorry that we had to. We went over time. And thank you, panelists. Thank you, speakers. Uh, I don't see Dr. Sandeep there. Okay, thank you so much, Marcus, for the excellent speech. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. It was amazing. Thank you, Kevin. E excellent as usual. Thank you so much. And Dr. Sandeep, I don't see you. Thank you so much. And I think because it's late, we overshot the time. Uh, we should call it today. And All anybody right. want anybody want to connect? I have shared my LinkedIn. Let's let's continue with the, with the dialogue and discussions. Maybe uh, we are living in a in a in a in a, in a global uh, village, so you know, distance is uh, not very much important. So let's let's keep on continuing these discussions. Maybe thank you so much. Absolutely, it's one of our enlightening episodes, and we shall continue soon. One we normally keep it once a month. And we shall next, we don't know what the next topic will be, but definitely there'll be something. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Mahindra. Thank you for all the compliments. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Good to see you, Marcus. See you. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you, you all. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.